Sometimes, when I'm overwhelmed by the complexities of life, I gaze heavenward and reassure myself that I am in the company of nebulae, white dwarves, black holes, quarks, dark matter, oort clouds, and limitless atoms, all dancing in celestial rhythm. And I reckon my own importance is imagined. Even when the side of the sun is blocked by the sheer girth of the rock I inhabit, I take solace in the thought that someone, somewhere, on some distant planet, in some distant galaxy, is looking at my sun as a tiny pinprick star of light in the vast expanse of space. And they too are coming to terms with their own insignificance. This is my star therapy. was that? <laughs> Megan, thank you. <laughs> Megan is moving to Raleigh tomorrow, and she was to most, supposed to move there today, and she moved her date so she could do this. Can we give her another round of applause? <laughs> and if you want to support her with a buy your cup of coffee, there's her Venmo. It's going to be up in the follow-up email, too. Anyway, good morning. My name is Tina Roth-Eisenberg. I'm the founder and host of Creative Mornings and the New York City chapter. And I want to welcome you all for being here. And I also want to welcome everyone on the live stream who made, who's probably sitting cozy in their bed with a mug. <laughs> Shout out to my friend Cameron, who gets up. He's getting up early in California to see Mac uh, speak today. So if he's hearing this, I'm proud of you, Cameron. I know you're not a morning person. Um, <laughs> First off, we're going to have Casey come up and tell us who the brave souls are that are going to do a 30-second pitch after uh, Meg's talk. For those of you that don't know what 30-second pitches are, uh, when you check in, when we do them, we announce them in the, fall, in the, in the sign up emails, um, you can put your name on a paper that goes into our beautiful pitch wheel. and. Four of you get the mic at the end of the event, and you can pitch anything you want. And when I say anything, I have a surprise for you right after. All right, Casey. I don't know if this is on. It sounds on. OK, so um, if I call your name just at the end of the talk, after the Q&A, please make your way up to these stairs over here. We'll have you come up, do your pitch, and then we'll take down your information. Sound good? OK. So if your name is Madiha, can I, can I hear you yelp in some way? What was that? All right. And then can I hear a yelp from a Jennifer with a smiling face on it? Someone says, I see crowds in the same crowds. Okay, so when I say you can pitch anything, in May of 2019, there was this jolly fella called Dean who did a regular pitch, like, my company's hiring a developer. But then I feel like he felt really inspired in the moment, 
and he did this. Um, also, I'm not going to pass at this opportunity. I'm like totally looking to manifest my next like long-term relationship. <laughs> break the taboo of like being single and like open to love to be honest with you like I'm a pretty decent human being <laughs> I don't online date I love animals uh, I love the beach I love surfing I'm a great cook I'm a member of my community garden um, I have I can pass a background check Dean Haddock Haddock like the fish like and I hope to hear from you. I don't think I've ever been happier. Because deep inside, I think I just put on the ev these events because I want people to fall in love with each other. So a few weeks later, I heard that from my community team that there was a woman in the audience that wrote down Dean's number and told her friend, Sydney, she's, she's like, you need to reach out to this guy. Sydney did, and they've been a couple ever since. <laughs> I asked them to read the manifesto for us today, and unfortunately they don't no longer live in New York City, so they sent the video. We are here to support you, celebrate with you, and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. We believe in face-to-face -face connections, in learning from others, in hugs and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone, Everyone is welcome. welcome. I just want to say this Giphy now exists, this GIF on Giphy.com because of this video. I watched it so many times just looking at the cute dog, Oliver. <laughs> okay, now you're all sitting here like, why in the world is Tina telling this whole story? Well, it relates to us being here in this room today. A few months ago, I was really stressed out because I just had such a hard time finding venues. Coming out of the pandemic has been really hard in reestablishing uh, relationships with venues and some of the ongoing ones we had, they were struggling and I totally get it. They were just, they couldn't take people like us in and generously host for free. So in, in a really kind of panicked moment, I reached out to my friend Amit who runs theidealist.org and he said, wait a second, you should talk to my friend Brian, who's at CUNY. A week later, I get on a Zoom to talk with Brian, and there is this wonderfully charming woman called Marielle instead. Brian was running a few minutes late, so Marielle and I were just chit-chatting, and of course I asked her, have you been to a Creative Mornings? And she smirked and said, oh yes. <laughs> she then very calmly mentioned, do you remember that guy that pitched love <laughs> in May in 2019. And I'm like, oh my God, yes, it's my favorite thing. It's my favorite story. And then she says very calmly, well, I'm the person that sent that note to Sydney. <laughs> I mean, seriously, can the story get any better? I mean, I just, I, I, I remember like typing all caps in Slack to my team. I just love when the universe is showing up like this and just like sending little hints. So anywhere, here we, anyway, here we are because of my friend Amit and Brian who eventually showed up on the Zoom and had to be caught up on the story and Marielle and 30 seconds pitches and love and now we're generously hosted at CUNY, at the CUNY Graduate Center. Uh, Marielle, Marielle, you and your team, and Anka, and Brian, and everyone, and Hector have made it so delightfully 
smooth and loving to plan this event. I can't thank you enough. Uh, for those of you who have been on the past few months signups, it's been a bit rocky for us. And uh, so this has, like, has restored my faith that th events can go really smooth. Um, fun fact about CUNY Graduate Center, you can rent this theater and there's additional event spaces and meetings room out, meeting rooms out there for, you know, if you have a business gathering, a filming project, a musical, a theater, whatever it is, you can rent a space. And in the follow-up email, there will be the info, or you can come up to us, we can connect you to Mariel. And we will also share a link in the follow-up email and in the live stream right now where, we, where uh, the Graduate Center would love to find out uh, what professional developments and uh, non-degree programs you all would be interested in because there might be a collaboration in the works, just saying. So thank you, Marielle and Brian. We're so happy to be here. All right. Raise your hand if this is your first Creative Mornings. So many. Raise your hand if this is your first Creative Mornings in New York City. I have to say, I just totally lurked in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> I overheard, and I can hold back, anyone who knows me is like, my lurking lasts for five seconds. Um, I overheard a conversation with two lovely ladies. Ladies, can you raise your hand, the ones I just talked to in the bathroom? <laughs> um, I overheard one person asking the other, uh, have you been to a Creative Mornings before? And like, this is when I'm going, oh. <laughs> and, uh, and one lady said, yeah, I've been going in Miami, and the other one has been going in DC, and there's nothing that makes me happier than when I hear you're hopping. You know, or you're moving to another city and you're going to the chapter there, so yes, it's working. Anyway, for those of you who are here for the first time, you might actually not realize that there's more than one chapter. So we, the Creative Morning started here in New York, but we have uh, chapters in 67 countries and over 200 cities. And that is possible. <laughs> because we have amazing, generous hosts and volunteers around the world who put on these events lovingly, for free, uh, in their cities, for free. For free. And how is it free? <laughs> how in the world is it free? I know. I'm still baffled 15 years in that I was able to do this. Um, but it's because we have really generous partners who help cover costs associated with the events. And we have generous hosts like the CUNY Center that host us for free. And the speakers donate their time. It's, a, it's literally a gen, an engine of generosity. So with that being said, please allow me to thank uh, our local partners who helped to cover the cost for today's event. First off, there's Harvest, just like us, they're a New York City-based company. They have su supported us ever since I can remember. Remember some of the very early days when there was only one chapter in New York City, they were su supporters back then. Um, if you need to track time, it's so dreadful. They made it so easy, so if you're a time-tracking human, go check them out. They also have a ton of super helpful resources on their site, and we'll share one example in particular in the follow-up email, um, how to build an effective year in business review. Boring, but it needs to be done. Anyway, um, a big giant thank you to our partner MPB. Uh, I have to admit, I had to find out what MPB was when they reached out to us, and I was like, why did I not know about this? Because I think we all have lenses or cameras or video equipment sitting in our drawers that we don't necessarily use, or we're thinking about upgrading, but we don't necessarily want to buy a new one. This is where MPB comes in. Uh, you can sell your equipment, you can buy used equipment. Um, it's a really lovingly run company and the people are amazing, so thank you, MPB. And then 1Password, they recently came on as a, as a partner and uh, I love nothing more than somebody when somebody wants to partner with us uh, when it's a product that I've been using for years and 1Password is that. Uh, I don't know what I would do without it. Raise of hand, who here uses 1Password? And I don't mean you just use one password for everything. This software, <laughs> one password. <laughs> so some of you. Um, it has been a game changer for me. I use it personally. I use it for my family. I use it for my, for my uh, work. Uh, I don't want to have to think about cybersecurity. So, and I never have to think about it because pass one password works. So thank you. And then last but not least, I want to thank uh, Microsoft Teams who's helping us prototyping how you can all stay connected in between events uh, with their Teams app. Um, who of you is already on the Teams app? 
Raise of hands, some of you, yes. So we put out postcards. Um, it's literally, we're experimenting with a space where you can put up, you know, if you, classifieds within our community, or if you're looking for something, or if you have something to offer. Um, the more you guys show up and put in, the more exciting it's gonna get. And we're just super thankful that Microsoft Teams is helping us with the software, and they're literally adding features as we ask and work with them, which is really, really cool. Are you still with me? I love this gift so much. Um, I showed it to my dog and was asking her if she had any interest to try this. She walked away. All right, rhythm. The theme this month is rhythm. It was chosen by our Basel chapter, my home country, and illustrated by Patricia Stadler. This is also a very Swiss name. That's so funny. All right, I am so excited to introduce today's speaker, Meg Lewis. But first, I want to give a shout out to this really cool slide and the person that designed this because the person is in the room. Grace Kim, where are you, Grace? Right there in the middle. She works. <laughs> She's a designer at 1Password. And when I told 1Password, when we were discussing about partnerships and, and I told them sort of, I don't even know why I told them, but in the very beginning, MailChimp, which was our only partner, made a custom slide for every speaker. And people were so into them. And then one password was like, we're doing that. So Grace has, has designed the slide for this month, and I love this new tradition, so thank you so much. So anyway, Meg, back to you. Um, Meg is a designer, speaker, comedian, and performer, and making the world a happier place with design and illustration, novelty fonts, classes, podcasts, and with her very wholesome Instagram content, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, her handle is your buddy Meg. I think you'll see it on the slides. Um, Meg is an incredibly talented designer and illustrator um, with a very unique, colorful style, as you will see in a second. And the cool thing is she has a background in improv, clowning, and comedy. And some of you might know that actually Meg was slotted for the August uh, month, and that fell apart. I don't want to go into details, but I had to tell Meg like three days before she was supposed to speak that I am so sorry, but we have to cancel this event. She was so cool and loving and chill about it. And she just told me this morning that she actually prefers like sort of when things kind of go wrong and she's such an improv human. <laughs> I have a feeling I will think about this tonight in bed and how I, can, how, how I can be more like you. So give a huge rock star round of applause to Meg. Hello. One more thing. I was taught in clown school that how you enter the stage matters the most. Okay, now that I'm out of breath, I have been training for this moment. Hello, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Creative Mornings. Tina, that was a great intro, oh my goodness. I'm so excited to be talking about rhythm with you all today. I was supposed to be, oh, I am out of breath. I was supposed to, I was supposed to be speaking on pride and then now it's rhythm and I was like, Tina, no matter what topic you give me, I can talk about it, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> all right, so what I wanna talk about is not just any kind of rhythm, this is not working anymore. And that's okay, because as you know, I like it when things go wrong. And it gives me an excuse to run more, because I can click the slide and then go over here. <laughs> I'm wearing a sweatsuit for a reason. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about rhythm in the largest sense. About the rhythm that you get, you know when you feel like things are just going your way, and everything's falling into place, and nobody's getting in your way for once? and everything's great because you're feeling great about where you're at in your career and in your life, and everything's feeling in sync and good, and finally, you deserve this and it's amazing. We're gonna talk about that kind of rhythm. <laughs> but first, I wanna introduce myself. I am Meg Lewis. I am, here we go with words and labels and things. I'm a queer, trans, non-binary designer, comedian, and performer working to make the world a happier place. And it's really weird to be able to say all of these specific labely words because it's taken me a very long time to feel proud and claim all of these individually. Thank you. We're gonna talk a lot more about these labels because I know that you have them too. 
So more words and things like that. These are all the things I do in my career. So many different random things. And none of these things really go together. But I try so hard to force people to let me do them. And hopefully some people will pay me to do them. And so that is my career. All of the things that I enjoy doing the most, I put in these little shapes. And these words and things change all the time. Once I'm realizing that something isn't fulfilling me anymore or is no longer fun for me, I get it out because I have a lot of other things I can do to fill in its place. So to quickly just run through my work so that way you can just judge me and decide if you care about my perspective or not, which I think is great. So here's my design and illustration work. As you can see, I have a style. And so I, <laughs> I started out as a product designer mostly not having a style and solving problems professionally for a living. And I realized I don't enjoy solving problems. I'm one of those people that gets paid to make things look pretty, the kind of people you're told that shouldn't exist. I'm one of those people. So I get hired more as an artist now than a problem-solving designer. And I love that because I will allow the people that love to solve problems to solve the freaking problems, and I can just provide that solution layer that they've already come up with. It's great. <laughs> I will say I get paid a lot less now, though. <laughs> and oh, the respect is lower as well, but that's fine. OK, so I'm also a performer. Uh, I aforementioned clowning. And so I love to perform. I love to be on stage. I love to make people smile and laugh and be silly and nonsensical. And so I have found a way to work that into my career as well. Because in the design industry, the bar for comedy is very low. And I'm not even that good. <laughs> I'm not even that good at all, but I can do it sort of. So it enables me to get on stage and in front of cameras for brands and things like that, if that makes sense. OK, other things I do, I'm just going to really go so fast here. So I have a comedy mindfulness and meditation podcast called Sit There and Do Nothing. I'm also currently working on a universe of my own that will be coming soon in videos and in podcast form and in real life called the Meg Lewis Funhouse. I'm also a member of CoLoop, which is an artist management roster and community. Yes, and I also teach classes because I have ideas and I like to share them with people as I hope you would like to figure out how to do too. I have like a free class where I teach people how to like knowledge share and figure out what perspectives they have on the world that they could share with other people. I have Full Time You, which is a career strategy program. And then I have Find Your Style, which is an online class for exactly what you think it is. Did you fix it? It's not working? No. No, Dana, it's not. But <laughs> improv. Improv, I'm sorry. It's not working. It's fine. I also <laughs> make novelty fonts. I don't know how to make fonts, but it's actually very easy. And so whenever you just make letters and put them into software, people can type on their keyboard and write words. <laughs> OK, so as you can see, I do a lot of different things. All parts of my brain, I smoosh them together and offer them to people, make them for the world. And sometimes people will also pay me to do those things for them. And it's the best. So this is the world's worst photo. I'm so sorry, but this just happened. This is the best you can get. But I recently got hired by Skillshare to do a YouTube series for them where they brought my world to life and I'm helping share my knowledge on creativity and exercises with their community. So stuff like that where I get to just be me for other people, which is the best. And then my obsessive sharing of my love for clowns attracted an upcoming clown museum to hire me to design their brand. What a treat. OK, and I also have horrible diarrhea. And so I talk about it all the time. I, is that the wholesome content Tina was talking about? I don't know. But I'm always talking about my diarrhea, because my diet is mostly queso and Taco Bell. So I have a diarrhea all the time. And that led me to get hired by Facebook and Messenger to make a diarrhea sticker pack. Like, <laughs> I'm getting Big Daddy to pay me to talk about diarrhea more. What a dream. OK. All right. OK, so I don't know why I'm jogging now, but I feel the sweatsuit is empowering me. Um, OK, so my idea for having a career like this, a specialty, if you will, which is just my own unique specialty, I guess, came from this extremely beautiful man, Taika Waititi. Oh my goodness, wow. So this TED Talk is from 2010. It's very old. I hope he thinks this notion aged well, because I do. And in this TED Talk, it blew my world wide open, because he said something so powerful for me specifically. He said, all I've got is creativity. That's my job. 
At the moment, I happen to be a filmmaker, but it's not my job. My job is to express myself and to share my ideas and my point of view. And when I saw this, I was like, wait a minute. I don't have to be a product designer in the tech industry. I don't have to solve problems for people anymore. I can just use my brain and kind of make whatever I want. As long as I'm sharing my brain, that can be my thing. I had been told throughout school that I had to have a niche and a specialty. I didn't realize this was an option. So as soon as I heard him say those words, I immediately tried an experimental phase in my career where I decided I'm just going to try to do my thing 100% for a couple of months. And if it works out, amazing. And if it doesn't, I'll just switch it back to the way it was before. And this trial period was incredible because I was able to finally use every single thing that makes me who I am, diarrhea and all, and smush it. Sorry, I'm using diarrhea and smush in one sentence. <laughs> smush it all together <laughs> to create a career that only I could truly have. And it started to work. The louder and more me I was, the more opportunities I was getting that were in line with who I am, the more opportunities I were, was getting where people were like, we don't care what you do, just do your thing. It's great. What a dream come true. And so that's what my unique brain is really excited about sharing with as many people as possible. This sort of intersection of nonconformity and non basically just doing what everybody else is doing to get by as being normal with career strategy. And this can help you determine what you can do, make, or create for the world that absolutely nobody else possibly could. OK, so I want to just get really sad for a second um, because I want to talk about developmental patterns in children and why we are the way that we are. There are many reasons why we are the way that we are, but this is a huge one. So whenever we're little babies and toddlers, generally under the age of seven, we're finally learning like how the world works. I have a new dog right now. And, he wants to be a good boy so bad, but he doesn't understand the rules of the world, so I'm having to teach him how the world works, and it's unfair, and it's not cool, and I feel bad for him that he can't just do whatever he wants all the time, but you have to learn, in order for your own safety, which we all did, we learned things like, okay, if I touch a hot stove, it's going to hurt, so I won't do that anymore. If I poke a wasp's nest, I'm going to be attacked and stung a lot. That's going to hurt really bad. And so um, obviously, the obvious, we, we, we all tried to fly, right? Everyone here. Um, so you, you think, oh, I could fly. That sounds great. You try it. You learn, oh, yeah, gravity is a thing that exists. And so this is what happens. This is how we develop into human beings and learn the rules of the world in order to keep us safe. And that's the most important thing there. But what happens when we're that age? is we also learn a lot of unnecessary truths based on uh, constructs and genera generational biases. And these are all things that people told me when I was a kid. And it got muddled in with all those other things. So I was like, OK, stove is hot, right? OK, got it. And also, uh, somebody told me, because I started having crushes on the girls and the boys, and somebody was like, oh, you can't choose the girls. That's gross. And I was like, OK, cool, because I didn't know, oh, that's how the world works, sure. And so somebody also told me that blondes can't wear yellow. Like, never wear yellow. You're a blonde. Oh, my, the horror. And so and <laughs> I remember seeing on TV that someone said that flat butts were out. And I was like, oh, my, my little body was like, oh, no. What? I think my butt is flatter than the adults I'm seeing. Oh, no. And so this got kind of mixed in with all the actual helpful truths for my own safety. And so this became just as important to my brain as all of those other things, which we know is what happens to us as we're developing as human beings. So in addition to this, we're all constantly prescribed with labels and identities against our own will, whether or not we want it. And with those labels, which you know what your labels are that people just gave you as soon as you were born, OK? Say that's about gender if we're talking about that. We're prescribed with these labels, these identities, and there's so many prescriptive um, traits that come along with each of these identities that we're supposed to just have. We're just supposed to have. Those are truths about us that were given to us that we're just supposed to naturally have, OK? And so some of these, oh, transition. Whoa. Um, <laughs> OK, so some of these <laughs> prescriptive traits are like what a body of a person that looks like you is supposed to look like, right? Just imagine your childhood self getting pressed this information upon, right? What your body is supposed to look like and how uncomfortable that made you feel when you realized that your body wasn't like that. And also what a personality of somebody that looks like you is supposed to have. Obviously, you probably didn't have all those personality traits, so that maybe made you feel a little bit weird and wrong. 
And then also, what a successful future looks like for somebody like you in your position. And we're all pushed on these notions onto us, and we're supposed to think that we have a certain life ahead of us. So this is what I was trying to do when I was a kid. And um, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a received well. Uh, <laughs> So I had great parents that allowed me to like do whatever I wanted, clothing-wise and hair-wise, which is great. However, we didn't have the language to really talk about it any further than that. So what happened was little Meg would uh, go into the girls' restroom, and uh, people would scream at me and make me leave. And so some days I would have to go all day without going to the bathroom because I couldn't find a bathroom that people would allow me to go in. And over here, like this is just my hair, I wanted it to be like the boys' hair because I really loved all the boys' options, didn't love the girls' options, but we didn't have the labels or the vocabulary to be able to describe what was happening to me at the time in my situation. So I was encouraged to dress like myself, but I didn't have any sort of way to talk about it any further and kind of figure out and explore what was happening there. Um, by the way, just look at my little hands resting on my dad. Um, <laughs> it's so precious. This is like one of the best photos of all time. Uh, <laughs> speaking of my hands, when we're talking about my body, I have very like unusual, you probably can't see them very well, I have very unusual hands. They're very coarse and wrinkly, and they've been like this since I was a child, right there. They're like that. If you zoom in enhance, you'll see. And so I was told the whole time I was growing up that I had old person hands, and that was sort of my nickname growing up, which was really fun for me. And so what I ended up doing is I ended up just balling up my hands all the time so nobody could see my palms. And I would walk around sort of like Arthur and uh, <laughs> just like this everywhere I went. And I didn't even notice that I was doing that until I was in my 20s. And so now when I lay my hand flat on a table, it's doing that. So that's, my, that's what my hand looks like when I'm just like resting. That's not good. Um, also, Sweet 18-year-old Meg got peace and love on my palms so I could spread it around when I shook people's hands. It's so, I know, it's so sweet. Okay, but let's talk about my sexual awakening, if we can, for a moment. Um, so, this was the most arousing thing I had ever seen. I wanted them all. I didn't have a favorite, I liked them all. And in my memory, I remember just staring at like the bulges and the shapes and digging this image back up, I'm like, what bulges and shapes? <laughs> There's none, they're so smooth. Uh, but anyway, I imagined them, I guess. And so what <laughs> I, I remember just staring at this and being like, what is this feeling? And oh, it was on a VHS cover. Anyway, I just want to show you the most erotic video you've ever seen in your life, real quick. Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. And so, as you know, what ended up happening to me is when I was drooling over every single Power Ranger, I was told, oh no, Meg, only the boys for you. And I was like, okay, fine. No problem. I like those too. Cool. And then I never got to figure out what was happening there until I dabbled in some erotic cosplay. Um, I mean, <laughs> look at my <laughs> blank stare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I went to a speaking coach once because I was required to by an event and the speaking coach told me that I should cry at this point in the talk and I thought that was so funny because I would never do that and this is like does not evoke tears this evokes laughter for me um, but, and she was like it'll help audience because connect with you more and I was like I'm not crying on cue anyway so like <laughs> like little Meg we're all conforming in various ways out of safety. We know this. It's very dangerous when we're different from one another, right? When you try to do anything that other people aren't doing that look like you, it's not great for your safety. So it makes sense that we're doing this, and we're doing it in such small ways to each other every single day. This is a tweet that I saw that is like perfectly encapsulates what I'm talking about. 
I loved seeing this. If you can't see in the back, it says, this is so interesting to me. Which way do you draw an X? Colored line being the first stroke. Uh, and then, no, sorry. Yeah, colored line being the first stroke, black line being the second stroke. It's got directional arrows on it. So I think that I'm a, I'm a seven. Anyway, but well, I was very excited to see this tweet because I was like, oh my goodness, I've never thought about this before. I can't, so naive. I can't wait to look at the comments to see what like regionally or around the world, what, what direction, like which number people are, wow. Um, and so I looked at the comments and they were all like, sort of that, um, <laughs> uh, but they were different numbers. They were different numbers. Everyone was like, if you're not four, you're a cop. And so, <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh my God. So I looked at that and for a second, I felt bad. I was like, oh, I'm doing it wrong. And I felt bad for the way that I draw my X's. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's so minuscule. <laughs> So no wonder we're terrified of being different from other people. We're cruel human beings and we're all hurt and scared because we don't want to be perceived as different. So we're all fighting to be perceived as normal and then bullying each other and judging each other and making fun of each other when we're not. It's very strange. And that is why the notion of be yourself is so confusing. <laughs> because it sounds so stupid and inspirational and meaningless, but it's actually the, truly the world's hardest task because there's real danger here for our physical safety. So I think that because it's the world's hardest task, it's also the world's hardest task because we don't even know exactly who we are and how to separate ourselves from like these voices of power that are just choosing whatever we want because making us feel insecure about ourselves is how people sell things. So if we can't even figure out who we are aside from that machine, it's very difficult to figure out exactly who you are as a person and what makes you amazing and unique and separate from everybody else in the most beautiful ways. So this is, leads to this feeling of not belonging constantly. I don't know about you, but I never felt like I belong. I don't know many people that <laughs> exist today that truly, really, actually felt like they belong because none of us are that prescription of our identities of the labels that were prescribed for, to us by other people. None of us are. Whew. I am wearing a sweatsuit, heavyweight sweatsuit, might I add, <laughs> was a bad idea. Um, okay, so talking about our futures and success, going back to that for a minute, we've all just been told like what success looks like for somebody like us, whether it was your parents generationally or whether it's society and constructs and all of that. And so we've been told that success looks very specific and like a very specific model. And then usually it's like things, buying things and better things and more things, second versions of the things we bought before. And that's generally what success is supposed to look like. And it took me, I made myself leave New York City and buy a house because I thought I was supposed to. And I got, I went and I bought a house and I was like, oh, I don't like this at all for me. <laughs> this is terrible. And I had to reconcile with the fact that I just felt pressured to do that at that point in my life. And it was a, totally a construct. And I was then stuck in this mortgage and I had to figure out how to get out of it. So taking the time to take the time to, sorry, take the time for independent thought is really helpful. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But this is sort of the model that we've been following for a really long time that a lot of people have to follow in order to survive. But we're looking to thrive here, okay? So this is the model. This is like what people were sharing on in the good old days when girls or boy, boys or men, I don't know, um, <laughs> is that this is what work looks like. You make, you make money, it's great. You, got, you made money. You're also gonna be miserable. And, and that's okay, because you were, you're working really hard, you're working for decades, and it's gonna feel miserable and terrible, but you're gonna make money, it's gonna be great. Um, and then someday, someday in the future, you'll finally be able to feel joy, because you won't have to do that anymore, and then you can take a break and feel joy finally, but just wait, it's gonna be like 40 years from now, and then you're gonna feel really good, and it's gonna be very joyous. Uh, <laughs> and a lot of that model comes from studying what successful people do. When we're in school, everybody is teaching this. This is like the common thing to teach. So if you want to do anything, you're supposed to look at a successful person, which is usually the person that has all the stuff, right? Okay, and so you're looking at them, and you're like, what are they doing? I'll just do what they're doing because it's a proven model that works. But the problem with studying what successful people does is it's, it's just a formula for success that maybe you don't even want yourself, and that's a formula that works for that person and maybe doesn't work for you. It also, just as we know, just repeats sort of 
this repetitive notion of how people are supposed to be doing things. It suppresses any kind of individuality or autonomy. And so that's how trends get created, is because we're all scared of being different, so we conform and we just do the same thing as everybody else because it works. And we know that the people that are actually doing it differently we know this. We see the people walking down the street that are totally themselves and wearing something that we feel like we could never wear ourselves. And you see that person and you're like, I'm so happy for them. I want to be like that person that's just doing something unique and being themselves 100% and they don't seem to care. What a relief for them that must be. And so we know that the innovators are the ones that are not following these formulas or of doing what the successful people are doing, but it really truly is the world's scariest task to do so. Okay, so talking about, again about independent thought. This is something that uh, when people ask me, like, how do I even know who I am? I say, we need to get to a place where you're constantly questioning everything. And I have to do this every single day because if I find myself noticing that I am judging somebody for anything, whether it's like they're doing something weird with their behavior, or they're wearing something strange or unusual, I find myself automatically going, oh, what's that? And then I have to stop myself and say, wait a minute, do I care what they're wearing or what they're doing? No, they look really happy. They're just doing their thing. I don't care at all. It's like this voice that's been implanted in our brains since we were in that de de developmental phase when we were kids that is training us to constantly perceive people in a, from a place of judgment, judging people that are different from us. So this is what we need to do is ask ourselves, stop and say, wait, do I agree with this thought I just had? Most of the time, I actually don't, and sometimes you do, and that's okay. But taking the time to actually assess these thoughts and audit your inner monologue, if you have one, and ask yourself if you agree is so helpful to try and piece together who you actually are as a unique, amazing person. Another thing that I would definitely advise is if you are in the place where you need to study what other people are doing, say, for example, you're invited to speak at Creative Mornings, and someone's like, okay, you can talk about whatever you want. You might look at other people's talks or think about the talks that you've seen before and think about what you liked and didn't like. What I implore you to do is ask yourself, how can I do that, but in a way that's more reflective of who I am? How can I bring myself and my own unique interests into this formula that everybody just kind of follows? Normally I play my theremin up here and give a meditation and juggle and stuff, but I don't have enough time today. Um, so I am sort of following a formula more than I do. Um, so don't be like me. Wait, this actually, <laughs> I didn't know this was in there. Okay, this is, like honestly, this is what I normally juggle. <laughs> okay, I don't, it really seemed like that I planted that there and I absolutely did not. That was past Meg having ideas, okay. So I think it's very important to know that, like my career where I'm a bunch of different things I'm smushing together and people are just gonna have to be okay with it, you are the same as that. You have so many different things that make you who you are that are very different from one another, meaning that two things that people don't often put together. So maybe you're like into unicorns and also like Slayer, whatever. I'm just trying to think of two things that are different <laughs> visually. So those two things make you who you are, even though they're very visually and thematically different. So whenever you have those things, that's what makes you who you are. So if you can try and smush those things together, it creates you, a person unlike anybody else, but it also can create a career, a personal style, so many different things that make you unique and help to communicate who you are to the world. Okay, so getting into this really quickly, we're almost done. I'm at peak moisture. Um, so thinking about how, what are the components that make you who you are and make you unique and original and amazing in you? It's your personality. We might share personality traits in common, but together you have a cluster of personality traits that are unlike anybody else's cluster in the world. And that is incredible. So if you can figure out how to communicate all those personality traits into the work that you're doing, into your career, into your life in some kind of way, the way that you're presenting yourself visually on social media, all of that, that's amazing. Same with skills, we all have our own unique skills that maybe we have one or two in common, but whenever you take all your skills and you smush them together, it makes you a person very qualified to do something that absolutely nobody else possibly could. Same thing with influences. Think about the things you were really into when you were a kid that you're still really into now, 
Those are the things that have influenced your life that remain with you, so they're more likely to stay with you as you continue through your life, which is very important because those things have a lot of visual qualities to them that you can then use to filter into your style. For me, clowns, circuses, mimes, was super into them when I was a kid and stuck with it ever since, and I've always felt like I really identify with them. So that helped me to come with, up with a visual language for my own style, so I make sure that I use a clown color palette as often as possible, and I always have to have black and white too because that means mimes, and that's why I have blonde hair, black glasses, dark eyebrows. It's all on purpose because it's a part of what has made me into who I am and who I am as a unique person that's unlike anybody else. So I'm able to communicate that visually for other people. And the best part is it makes me feel so at home with myself and I feel so seen by myself when I'm dressing and looking like this. Um, we all have unique points of, points of view and perspectives on the world that don't come naturally to other people. So those things that you just say to somebody where you say something that just seems obvious to you but they respond, oh wait, I never thought of it like that before. Write those things down always, because that means that your brain has a unique look on something that doesn't come naturally to each other people. And I want to live in a world where we're all able to share our own unique points of view with each other and grow each other's worldview together. Uh, personal style. I've alluded to this so often, but I think it's so important because it, when you can try and figure out how to visually communicate who you are with the way that you dress, the way you decorate your spaces, your website, anything you have to do visually, it's so helpful to figure out who you actually are so that you're not sort of um, obeying the trends of now that are usually just promoted and, and curated by the people with the most power. Okay, so quickly going back into labels like mine that you saw at the beginning, um, it's so helpful to think about all the labels that were given to you when you were born. It could be about your personality. I was told I was a shy person for most of my life. I was, a, I was the shy one. Shy was one of my labels. And it, no, no it's not. And so you have to think about what the labels were that were given to you that you've just been kind of wearing and carrying around with you this whole time. And ask yourself, do you actually feel empowered? Do you feel good about this label? Does it feel like it even goes with who you are? And maybe this is the time to finally shed those and let those go. And on the other hand, it's time to take charge of your own identity and take charge of who you are and start claiming the labels that you feel like actually empower you, okay? It took me a really long time, a lot of fighting, to actually be like, I don't actually want to be thought of as a woman anymore. It's very difficult to do that because that's a really big label. So it's important that you ask yourselves how you can take charge of your own identity and stop just going along with what other people decided you were a long time ago. All right, so closing it out, I just want you to know that you, I, everyone in this room, everywhere, has the ability to do, make, or create something for the world that absolutely nobody else can. It's just a really big puzzle <laughs> to try and figure out how you can do that. So thank you, everybody. Yay! Do we have time for Q&A? Q&A. Sample questions in case. Meg, you're the funnest. The funnest ever. I'm hey, so can we give her another round of applause? Can you, if you have a question, stand up and say your name, please. Hello, I'm Anne. Hi, Anne. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your story and sharing all of this with wonderful people in the room who are also creative. Um, I find that um, one of the things that gets asked often is, how can I be myself if no one will pay me to be myself? <laughs> And um, can you share a story about maybe the first one, two, three times that you felt like you were paid to be yourself, how you got there, the connections you made, et cetera? Absolutely. So I, that experimental phase that I had where I just decided to go 100% for it for a little bit of time and hope for the best, that's where everything kind of came to light for me because before that, I was pretty much like miserable with all the clients I was working in, with and the 
projects I was working on, but every so often I'd get a project that was really fulfilling to me. So I had to ask myself, what are the qualities of those projects that are going so well and why? And it was always that feeling of like feeling the connection between the actual person I was working with because they saw me for who I was and they were allowing me to use my unique brain in a way throughout the project. They weren't just prescribing me with what to do and making me be somebody I wasn't. So that was a really big indicator for me, is that connection that I had with the individual client, not always even the project, a lot of it was just the connection with the human being on the other side. And so whenever I went into that experimental period, I had to be extremely stubborn about it and very hardcore and say absolutely no way to anybody that came to me that wasn't fitting that goal of mine of just doing projects that made me, enabled me to use my unique brain. So with those, it was very scary because I knew I would be scaring away 95% of potential opportunities. And I was, I'm a freelancer, so I'm always struggling to survive. <laughs> so I, I, it was terrifying to do that. But whenever I was as loudly myself as possible, and this is something I have to remind myself to do daily, <laughs> is whenever I'm loudly myself, I end up attracting fewer clients, fewer opportunities, but the ones that I attract are so in line with who I am and the way that it's usually communicated to me by the client is like, Meg, we don't even know what to tell you because we're not you. Like, just do your thing and we'll, we'll kind of guide you along the way. And that's the best thing to hear from somebody is when they're just like, you know you better than us, so you do your thing. And wow, how freeing and wonderful. So looking for those qualities and trying to figure out what makes you feel the best, which opportunities and which projects you've done throughout your career has been very helpful for me and try to piece through what the through line of that is to try and skew yourself in a direction where you're feeling the most fulfilled by your work. Oh. Oh. Hi, she's one of the ladies in the bathroom. She's the DC girl. <laughs> Oh, you're so cool, and I want to be your best friend. Oh, okay, um, let's do that. <laughs> but I, I am making an assumption, but I assume, well, actually, you did say you have a lot of ideas all the time, mm -hmm. and I find it's really hard to ground myself mm -hmm. when I'm all over the place. Yes. So do you have a morning rhythm or just something to ground you, like, right when you wake up? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I... I, th this is the reason why I've always worked for myself is because I have, uh, this is probably different from a lot of people here, but I have to have every day different or else I start to panic because I'm losing control or whatever, I don't know. And so every day I, I wake up and I go, I, what should I do today? And I look at my calendar and see what do I have to do today? And what do I want to do? And then I like go, I usually every day I work from like three or four different places. I'm just wandering around, get myself some nachos, diarrhea. And then, uh, <laughs> and so I'm like all over the place and I have so many ideas and I usually, this sounds wild, like how could this ever work? But I usually do what I have to do first and then follow whatever is the most exciting and fun for me for the rest of the day. And that's how I usually make my best work. I've learned that if I just trust that process, it works out. But I think that's because my personality, I, I always get the work done and I am so excited about the work that I'm doing that I want to do it. I'm having a lot of fun doing it. So as long as I just do the things that I have to do first, that's what I've realized is the key. And then I get to have fun for the rest of the day. Well, thank you. Yeah. Hello. I can't see you at all. You're right where the light is. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so I, my, my question is, like, if, if you feel like part of the key feature of your personality is sort of being a chameleon and sort of cosplaying as the role of whatever situation you're in, like, you're in a corporate environment and you're like, this is kind of fun to, like, you know, put on a suit and then you're in, like, you know, like a clown environment and you're like, this is kind of fun to, like, wear a bunch of different colors. How do you, do you ever, do you ever find yourself being like, how do you find the center? Like, what's actually me when, when, when like, because when, at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm not sure that I'm any of these people. And I kind of like the Bowie answer of just, like, being one person at a time. But, like, the question is, how do you find the center when you don't feel particularly connected to any, like, one aesthetic or set of ideas or anything like that when you kind of just like trying them on and think they're fun, but, but don't feel, like, personally, like, oh, this one is, like, really me? Mm-hmm. 
Um, I also love to be a character. How fun, how freeing to just be someone else for a little bit. I think that's a wonderful exercise and I think that that's a great exercise for trying to figure out who you actually are. And if that's part of your personality that you like being a caricature of different types of people, then that means that's who you are and that's part of who you are. Uh, most people don't like doing that. So that's a really amazing thing that you can do that other people can't do and that can be part of your identity and that's okay. So I think as generally, I think whenever you're exploring who you are at your core and your center, a lot of people feel um, guilty or embarrassed about who that might be because it maybe is different or whatever. And so a lot of people are like, but I'm undesirable or my personality isn't great or like it's not what you said it should be. And so my thing is like, as long as you're not harming yourself or other people in your actions and what you're doing as who you are, then you're, you're doing a great job and that's all we're looking for here. So I think that, Part of yourself is huge in probably what your identity is and keep going with it if that's what makes you feel fulfilled. Um, and finding that center piece is I think always looking for through lines between what those things are because like I said earlier with the unicorns and the slayer, it's <laughs> those caricatures of whoever you're being, whatever it is, they are very different from one another and whenever you smush them together it does actually make you, which is somebody that can do somebody something that nobody else can. And within that, you can always find little through lines of consistencies or pieces of that unifies those things together. And I think that that's usually the central force behind who you are at your core. It's very difficult to figure out though. It's like a puzzle. <laughs> um, hello. Hello. <laughs> um, your examples really inspired me and I just really wanna know what your top three beans are. My <laughs> oh, beans. No one ever, okay, great, thank you. I've been waiting. Uh, okay, top three beans. I'm gonna go with definitely a big juicy white bean. Whoa, I think they're having a moment though. Um, I, Cause I'm a big soup fan, I think they're great in soup. Uh, and then I love a refried black bean. I know refried doesn't really tie, you know, it's the style of black bean. Love a refried black. Um, don't like a black bean burger, though. Let's not talk about that with me. Um, and I, I was vegetarian for a very long time during the black bean burger phase of the world. And anyway, um, last bean, is this, a, is this sad to say coffee bean? I'll just eat them, though. I don't mind. Okay, one more question, and then we have to, we have to unfortunately wrap it up. Cool. I'm Exa. Thanks, Meg, so much. My last question is you've been talking you know, so, much, so beautifully about stepping into ourselves and the things that we know to be true about ourselves but that might be scary. When you started doing that or when you started putting yourself out there even more fully, what were the words that you told yourself so that you could do that? Oh yeah, I, whenever I first started trying to figure out who I was, it was a very intentional process because I had no idea and I didn't have any tools to help me figure that out. So I had to truly ask the people in my life that I felt like I was the most comfortable being my weirdest self in front of. And I had to ask them to tell me who I was. And I, cause I truly did not know. And when they, what they told me, I was so shocked by, cause it was so far from who I thought I was and how I thought I was presenting to other people. And so those words from truly my best friends guided me in trying to figure out more about myself and really being excited about the way that the people that really loved me, that really saw me, would describe me as. So I think that that exercise was so, so, so helpful for me. And it's very important to me to constantly, very often remind myself of what those crucial parts of me are and what the magic I have is. And because this world is hell, I think we are living in hell. And so it's, <laughs> it's very important for me to remind myself that my job here is to be a light and my job is to share that light with other people to try to make the world a little bit brighter. Uh, it's the world's hardest task, but I'm here to try. And so I do remind myself that, of that all the time because that is what other people have told me that is my superpower. So I try to hold on to it as much as possible. You're not trying, you're succeeding, Meg. Thank you. Thank you, team. You're incredible. You're Mech is an absolute national treasure. There is no doubt about it. Wow. Okay, 30 second pitches. The, th the four of you that we mentioned before, come on up quick, 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 because we're running a tiny bit late. I'm so sorry, cutie. All right. 30 second pitches, come on down. Um, 
who is taking notes of my team? Of like Krista is on it. So whoever gets off, like when you're done with your pitch, can you talk to Krista, who will be over here, so she, she can write everything down, so we can send it out, please. Hello, um, I am uh, Alan Wyman. Uh, I am a software engineering manager uh, for about six plus years, and I am passionate about making the web better, faster, more accessible, more equitable, and more enjoyable to use. I also feel similarly about cities, uh, hashtag war on cars. Um, I started as a front end engineer. I worked on a bunch of component libraries throughout the years. Um, I pushed for responsive web design way back when it was just getting started at uh, companies like E-Trade. I worked at the nonprofit Mozilla for five years. Uh, earlier this year, the startup I enjoyed working at got acquired and the misery started to creep in, so I quit. Uh, I'm enjoying some time off and available to start work in January. Uh, if you're looking for a full-time or contract engineering leader to push for a better user experience, let me know. So nervous. The moment I filled the pitch form, I was regretting it, but <laughs> here I am, and I feel like this is my calling. My name is Madiha Malik, my ethnicity is Pakistani, and I'm a graphic designer. I enjoy creating bold, playful illustrations, which is why I fell in love with Meg's work. I also incorporate Arabic type into my designs, which is the language of my religion. I'd love to find work to do this more often, so please feel free to reach out to me. I also design Arabic Persian calligraphy jewelry. This is a little scary, but I have to end with something that's becoming very important to speak out for the voiceless, and it's a statement of humanity, justice, and compassion. This is to free the Palestinians and to cease fire now. Thank you. All right, my name is Jennifer Summers, and I too was not expecting for my name to be pulled, so preemptively I pulled one of the uh, sheets myself to make sure that the three things I selected, looking for work, personal project, and a date, were fresh of center. Um, my background in particular is quite eclectic professionally, having lived and worked in the States and overseas in teaching, advertising, film. I'm currently in career transition, trying to find the intersection of all of these crazy adventures I've had, these work experiences I've had that have had touch points with French, Spanish, English, uh, so many different things from like walking across Spain, doing the Camino, um, woo, for those of you guys who have done that adventure. And for whatever reasons, in this particular moment with this multidisciplinary background, I somehow feel that higher ed is the next path for me. So I've been looking at schools like NYU and thinking that there might be an opportunity to contribute to finding the direction and the path for students looking to be on their own way, their own quest. So if anyone is either connected to NYU or something in higher ed that would be open to either sharing their story or might have an opportunity for someone like me, Totally on board for having that conversation and seeing what might unfold. Hello, party people. My name is Claire Kernick, and I am an anthropology-based creative strategist and consultant. I finished my degree at Columbia in anthropology, and I'm looking for work to put my skills to test. So you might be thinking, what can anthropology tell us about creative strategy? Well, at the very base level, what we do as creative strategists is understand audiences. There's a lot of ethnographic research that goes into that, but we also get really interesting questions as consultants and strategists. So, you might get asked about, you know, what should be our gift with purchase strategy? Well, what is a gift? Why do we give gifts? In some cultures, it's been about establishing loyalty. Sometimes it's about hierarchy, saying, I'm better than you, you're better than me. It can be everything, and using anthropology to decipher that is often um, a great tool. Last thing I'll say, too, um, that I get really excited about is the beauty ritual. When you really look at a ritual, you're thinking about transformational processes. So when you really understand the questions that are being asked, uh, you can use anthropology as a tool to answer them. So if you are looking to see what an anthropologist can do on your team, please reach out. I'd love to work with you.
All right, before we wrap things up, important message, there's more breakfast and coffee, so on the way out, grab another one. Team, be ready to actually pour the coffee. Thank you. And uh, a few thank yous. Without our organizer team, we, uh, the New York City team, we couldn't make these events happen. So Leah, Emily, Cece, Kelly, Casey, Krista, Shirley, Exa, Me Megan, Maria, Dan Danielle, Brian, Josh, Ella, Evelyn, Celestine, and Angelica. Thank you so much for making these events happen. Then thanks to Ben. You can watch this talk again. He, was, he came back. He was our longtime videographer for years on end, and he stepped in for Connie today. Thank you, Ben. And then Nelson took photos of you, so you can see how good you look this morning. And then thanks to Kevin and Matthew, the people on the live stream could watch as well. Thank you all so much. These fine gentlemen are for hire, by the way. So is Ben. And um, next month, I'm so excited. We have Debbie Millman interview Stefan Sagmeister at the SVA Theater on December 15th. This should be a good one. And, and I want to leave you, as always, with a quote. The longer I live, the more deeply I learn that love, whether we call it friendship or family or romance, is the work of mirroring and magnifying each other's light by James Baldwin. Thank you for being here. Thank you, CUNY, and see you next month.